We have a tendency to spend much more time focusing on the question of the gifts of the Holy Spirit than in focusing on the matter of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And yet, it is the chief goal of the Holy Spirit to apply the fruits of the gospel in such a way to fulfill God's mandate that this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And the greatest manifestation of our progress in the things of God will never be through the spectacular manifestations of gifts that we have, whatever the gifts are. A person, for example, today could be an extremely gifted preacher or a gifted teacher and yet show very little evidence of growth in maturity in the things of God. Beloved, we're going to be examined and evaluated at the end of our lives, not by the number of gifts we display, nor by the talents God has given to us, but we will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ by how much fruit we have borne as Christians. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit in his letter to the Galatians in the fifth chapter. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Stop right there. Here's the first apostolic mandate, that as Christian people, we are called to walk in the Spirit. That does not mean that our primary task is to be pursuing mysticism, or to be caught up in forms of magic, or in shortcuts to spirituality. I've had countless students come to me in the seminary and other places and say to me, how can I become more spiritual? Or how can I become more pious? Or how can I become more gifted? I've yet to have a student come to me and say, what I really need to know is how can I become righteous? In the New Testament, Jesus himself says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added onto you. We are supposed to be demonstrating our spiritual growth, our walk in the Spirit of God, which demonstration of our walk in the Spirit of God is not to be seen in the manifestation of the gifts. The demonstration of our walk in the Spirit is to be manifested by the fruit of the Holy Ghost. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Earlier we see Jesus saying, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And in your flesh you can do nothing. There he's not talking about your physical body. He's talking about your fallen human nature, which includes not only your body, but your mind, your will, your heart, and so on. Before Paul talks about what it means to be led by the Spirit, and before the Apostle details for us the fruit of the Spirit, he first shows us what the fruit of the Spirit is not. Because remember, he's making a contrast here between the flesh and the Spirit. So he begins with the negative. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and this time the apostle leaves no doubt that this list is not exhausted because he adds, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is one of the scariest passages in the Bible. Those who practice such things, adultery, fornication, lewdness, hatred, jealousy, wrath, selfish ambition, heresy, drunkenness, and so on. 
that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, why is that so terrifying? Well, because we know all kinds of people who have made profound professions of faith in Christ who fall into adultery, who struggle with alcohol, who battle with pride and contentiousness and things of this sort through their whole lives. And if you just look at this text, you might come to the conclusion, well, anybody who ever falls into any of these sins has no hope of salvation. But when Paul speaks about practicing these things, he's not saying that if you get drunk once, you won't go to heaven. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying if these things define your lifestyle, if you put a mirror up to your life and this is what your life looks like, that this is your practice on a regular basis, then that's an indication that you are in the flesh, that you are not of the Spirit of God, and that you are still unregenerate and will not be included in the kingdom of God. I think it's important for us to understand that because here, against all types of antinomianism, that says, well, I believe in Jesus, now I can live however I want to live, and that there's no change in my life from my regeneration, those people need to read this portion of Galatians to see that Paul gives the very sober warning that if this is your practice, then those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in contrast to the works of the flesh, Paul gives the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Now notice, he is giving an admonition to people in the church who are believers not to fall into the works of the flesh, but to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And that tells you, doesn't it, that even Christians, as long as they are Christians, still have to battle with the old nature, still have to battle with the flesh, so that there is that element of flesh that remains in the Christian life that has to come under the constant scrutiny of the Word of God, that has to come under the constant discipline of the Holy Ghost, that we may be convicted of sin and flee from these things and seek to cultivate the opposite kind of practice. And that which is cultivated is that which bears fruit. And we remember our Lord said, it is by their fruit that you will know them. Now, what do you want on your gravestone? You want it said that you earned so much money or that you won so many battles or that you expressed so many talents and were prodigious in extraordinary feats? Or do you want to have on your tombstone, here was a person who manifested love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Yet the thing is, these are the things that God wants from us. These are the things that God delights in. And yet we do not make them a priority in our lives. Now we all are aware that we should be more loving. And that particular fruit has been given lots of ink and lots of space And yet, even at times, we have a very superficial understanding of what love means. But love, in its spiritual dimension, is inseparably related to the other fruit. Now, notice the difference here between the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. In the gifts of the Spirit, Paul labors the point of unity and diversity. And he goes through that lengthy rhetorical sequence when he says, do all have the gift of preaching? Do all have the gift of teaching? Do all have this gift or that gift? And the obvious answer is no. He doesn't do that with the fruit of the Spirit. 
It's not like the apostle is teaching here that just as the Spirit distributes individual gifts to particular people in the church for the edification of the whole body. So the one person may have the gift of administration, the other person may have the gift of giving, the other person helps or whatever it is. And then in like manner, he gives one person the fruit of love, another person the fruit of gentleness, another the fruit of patience, and another the fruit of joy. No. The fruit of the Spirit in all of its fullness is to be made manifest in every Christian's life. All of us are called to bear the fruit of love. All of us are called to gentleness or to meekness. Now, it's one thing to be called to wimpdom. So often in our culture, the idea of being meek or gentle means that we lack strength or we can begin to give accolades to the coward. No. A gentle person is a person who has strength but restrains the use of that strength. Well, gentleness is something akin to sensitivity. And again, to be gentle means to use less force than you could use in a given situation. It doesn't mean that you never use your strength. I think we take a cue from Jesus at this point. One of the things that I find remarkable about the behavioral pattern of Jesus in how he deals with people is that he is exceedingly tender with the weak and the powerless of his world. The woman caught in adultery, everybody was ready to rip her to shreds, and he was tender and gentle with her. But when the power mongers of the day, the Pharisees, came on Jesus, trying to exercise their strength, he responded with great strength. In other words, he was strong against the strong, firm against the powerful, but tender with the weak. And we have a tendency to think that we're supposed to treat every person that we meet in the same manner. No. We have to learn how to monitor and moderate the strengths that we have. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. You know, it's to be a mark of the Christian life that as Christian people who are walking in the Spirit of God, that we are not sour pusses, that we have real joy in our lives. I mean, even the joy of the Spirit does not preclude grieving. It does not preclude experiencing pain and affliction. But the point is, as the Apostle explains, particularly in his epistle to the Philippians, that in all things we learn to rejoice because the basic conduit for our joy is our relationship to God and the redemption that we have, which is never threatened by the loss of a loved one or the loss of possessions or the loss of the job, or the loss of anything else. We may suffer all kinds of setbacks and afflictions in this world that are painful, but those things are not to rob us of the foundational joy that we have in Christ that we can rejoice in all things because the rest of these things are insignificant compared to the wonderful fullness of the Spirit that we enjoy in the presence of God. But that is something that has to be cultivated. The more we understand our relationship with God, the more we understand His promises in our lives, the greater the joy that we will begin to bear as the fruit of our Christian life. Love, joy, gentleness, peace, long-suffering, and kindness. Long-suffering is kind of related to patience. Notice that in these fruits that we are called to emulate, that these fruits imitate the very character of God. It's God who is love. It's God who's the author of joy. It's God who manifests a supreme gentleness to His people. And if anyone can be said to be long-suffering, it's God. God is not quick to anger. He's not hasty 
to judge, but he's patient, he's forbearing, and he gives people time to turn around. He doesn't just off with their heads the first time they do something that annoys him or that irritates him. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness and goodness and kindness. You know, kindness is one of the most difficult virtues there is in the world to define. And yet, there's a sense in which it doesn't need to be defined because everybody in the world knows what it is. You know it when somebody is being kind to you, don't you? And you know it when somebody's being mean to you. And so the opposite of meanness is kindness. And that simply means that we're caring, that we're considerate, and that we are nice to people. And that's part of the fruit that we are to manifest.